Almanac Gardener, produced in association with the Cooperative Extension Service at North Carolina State University. Here's Mike Gray. Hello again. Welcome back to Almanac Gardener. We're glad you're with us. On this program, we'll have a look at pruning crepe myrtles, one of the most favorite ornamentals across North Carolina, and a feature on something called grass cycling. So I hope you'll stay with us. And we'll have your gardening questions answered from our panel of experts with the Cooperative Extension Service in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences at North Carolina State University. And Toby Bost is back with us. Toby's a horticultural agent in Forsyth. Toby, how are you? I'm doing great, Mike. How about you? I went up your way just a little bit further west the other week and got into a different kind of pollen, Toby, mm -hmm. and you can sort of tell the difference, you know. <laughs> you, you come down with things you had about two weeks before. Yeah. Well, definitely, as you, as you head west, you're going to find out the, the plant cycle, bloom cycle, pollen, every, everything is uh, delayed. Is so, uh, yeah, I would uh, anticipate that. About a six-week uh, difference, I think, from one end of the state to the elevation, other. Uh, going up a, a mile high almost That's in it. some of these areas, it will change. Well, you know, it's uh, June, it's getting hot, and folks are starting to water, but they have to be careful applying that water to certain crops, don't they? Well, Mike, uh, we have tall fescue lawns primarily in our area, and uh, you've got to be careful about watering, particularly water in the evening if you're going to irrigate your lawn. Now, I ha I'm on a well, so I don't irrigate my fescue lawn. And sometimes, you know, we have a drought, I have to do a little uh, overseeding in the fall. But, but uh, by and large, if you don't have an irrigation system, I would probably just let tall fescue go dormant. It generally will come back and generally will die. If you have problems with brown patch disease, uh, you're probably putting on too much fertilizer in the spring. You really should put your nitrogen on primarily in fall and winter anyway. So back off on the fertilizer and have the soil tested. But don't do a lot of watering, daily watering in the evening because you will create a brown patch fungus problem. Okay, and you're saying don't necessarily uh, water fescue, tall fescue in the summertime. Karen, you live in a neighborhood where folks water, folks don't water? Folks water. Do they? And they, I get nasty looks when I leave notes on their door. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're into water saving. We are. Uh, Guilford County, of course, has a um, uh, water problems. We, we don't have a supply of water that meets the needs of everybody in the community to be watering their lawn. And like Toby, you don't need to be watering these fescues. Mm -hmm. It may keep them green, but oftentimes it does bring on disease problems and it certainly pushes our drought and pushes our, our water supply to its max. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, now that we're getting into the warm summer months, folks are looking for a cool, shady spot to go and sit. They maybe are. have some vegetation, nice plants, and you brought some I in. did, because uh, that's where I'm headed during the summer months. A nice couple here with me today. This one, we'll start with the, the uh, white one, is a stilby, and it's going to start blooming in the Piedmont area. Um, typically the 1st of June or so. And it comes, this one's white, but it comes in any number of colors. Um, there's a pink, there's a, a deeper red, almost a lavender color. The one right directly in front of it is what they refer to as lungwort, uh, pulmonaria. And uh, it also has a flower. This one happens to be called Sissinghurst white, just barely coming out. But the foliage to me is very attractive. Mm -hmm. Great combination with hostas. Uh, next to it is the coral bells, and uh, this one's not blooming, but coral bells throws up a nice uh, shoot of uh, flowers as well. Behind it, directly behind, is that of the columbine, and this is the wild columbine. It has uh, the um, orange uh, top with the yellow centers, seeds itself, great for the hummingbirds in the, the landscape. And the last one, a short variety down here, also good for around uh, water situations, is that of the forget-me-not. And this is a pink forget-me-not, but there's also blue. And all of these are great for the shade. So don't just, you know, not just hostas. There's lots of plants that you can use for that shady spot. Very colorful, very cool, sort of chill you out That's on, right. a, on a summer day. Thanks for bringing those in. Bill Lord's back with us. Bill has been out in the greenhouse, and the first crop of greenhouse tomatoes are in, and those are some Maters. That's right. These are nice, and uh, these come from a friend of mine named Billy Wood up in, uh, I guess it's Castalia. But these, this variety is called Trust, and Billy doesn't use much fertilizer, and that's why these tomatoes, you can just, t you can, they look good and they mm -hmm. taste good. They're nice and soft and juicy. When you buy tomatoes in the grocery store, frequently they're hard as a baseball. That's because they shoot them up with potassium to make them hard so they can move them around and ship them. These don't have much potassium, and in your home garden, I would lay off the potassium, too. 
and uh, you'll get much softer, juicier tomatoes, which is why you want to grow homegrown tomatoes either in your greenhouse or in your garden, either way. Mm -hmm. And those are available at farmer's markets, roadside stands? Yeah, there are a lot of greenhouse tomatoes in North Carolina, and uh, they're of superior quality. That's why people like them. Okay. Good to eat. Thanks for bringing those in, Bill. Yeah. Had a loaf of bread and a little uh, mayonnaise. <laughs> mayonnaise. Oh, mayonnaise. Okay, we are ready. Uh, Karen, here's some questions that we got from uh, audience. Uh, you folks watch Almanac Gardener. This week, uh, Bonnie Holland in Shawboro writes this and says, I need help with my peonies. Their established plants grow beautifully. They fill with buds, but then the buds turn brown and usually don't open. If they do, they're brown inside. What could be causing this problem? There's a couple of things that can cause that. Um, one is uh, cold. If we don't have enough cold, oftentimes the plants will not, they'll form the buds, but the buds will not open. Another is if we get a real hard cold snap while the buds have been formed, um, this often will, will cause the, the buds to um, stop development and they'll just stay right there in that small, small stage. Last two are uh, an insect known as thrips will get into the bud and feed on the bud. And when she talked about it opening but being brown on the inside, thrips cause that type of damage. Uh, very small, the use of orthene should take care of that. And the last one is a disease problem known as um, botrytis or gray mold and the use of daconil as a product. And oftentimes the gray mold will move not only from the bud itself but down the stems and you can, you can watch for that. So there's a variety of problems. A problems that can occur. You know, one of the most agonizing chores for some of us gardeners this time of year is pruning our ornamentals or our trees. If you'd like to know the proper way to do that, let's join Bill as he shows us how to prune crepe myrtle. Crepe myrtles are an ideal tree or shrub for the southern landscape in that they're very versatile plants. They, uh, they do well in a number of environments. They're native of China, and they'll grow anywhere in North Carolina except for the very highest mountains. They have a lot of interest for the landscape. They have beautiful flowers, as we see here in this variety. They've got dark, waxy green leaves. They've got a nice shape, a pendulous shape when they get older. They have attractive bark on the, uh, on the, on the trunks. And in the fall, they have nice bright colors, oranges and reds. And in the winter, even, they have seed pods, which add interest, too. Now, crepe myrtle is a good urban tree or shrub. It depends on how you prune them, because they, uh, they can tolerate pollution, and uh, they won't get big enough to get up in the power line, so the power companies like them. Plus, they won't heave sidewalks with their roots like some trees will do, so they're really a popular choice for urban situations. There are a lot of crepe myrtle varieties out there. There was a very successful breeding program at the National Arboretum in Washington, D.C. about 10 years ago that developed a number of varieties that have good characteristics. They all have Indian names. This one's called Natchez. It's one of my favorites. It's a white variety. The colors also range from pink to lavender to purple to red. You can get anything you want. You can also get different sizes in these varieties from the Arboretum. You can get things like winter hardiness as well as resistance to powdery mildew, which is a real scourge to some types of crepe myrtles. So look for these Indian varieties and look for the characteristics at the nursery when you go to buy the plant and get what you want. You can customize your crepe myrtles now. Now, crepe myrtles don't need a lot of pruning and training, but some people feel like they have to prune them. And let me show you a way you don't want to do it right now. This is an example of how not to prune a crepe myrtle. It's what my horticultural colleagues call crepe murder. And this one's been murdered. Now, the first thing that's gone wrong here is they've taken out one of these major stems at ground level, and you've got all these root sprouts or root suckers. And it's going to sprout like this every year for the course of the growing season. So to correct this, well, you really can't. You've got to continually prune these things out. So you've got a real mess here. Now, they've also left a guy wire in this plant, and I've got one right next to me over here that shows you even better. When this plant was installed, they put wires in and used an um, old piece of garden hose to uh, protect the plant. They left the hose in, it grew up, and you've got a zone of included bark here now and a very weak branch, a place for disease to enter, and this branch is going to break off. Plus, it doesn't look good. So that's another thing you don't want to do. Take those wires and pieces of hose off the plant as soon as it is as firmly established. Now, the third thing wrong here is they have topped this plant. They went up to the top about a year or two ago and they just cut it off, topped it. And you've got what we call in horticulture, what we, what we, what we call is a witch's broom up here right now. And it's a mess. You've got just a proliferation of sprouts. 
you have lost that pendulous weeping effect and you just got a ruined plant. Now, can this plant be saved? Well, you could take out the guy wire, you could cut the root sprouts out a couple times a year, and you might be able to go up here and select out one or two branches and hope you could regain that form. But really, this plant has been murdered. Thus, we call it grape murder. Now, let's go look at how do we should properly prune a grape myrtle. To properly prune a grape myrtle, you want to remove these lower branches here. And I've got a branch here that needs to come out, and I'm going to show you how to do it. Get a little pruning saw out here and just take this branch off. You want to keep the collar in place and just take it out, and that'll heal over. And it gives you this nice effect here. You can see the uh, exfoliating bark on this crepe myrtle. It's a nice color and texture, and it gives you a good look rather than this topped business with a top notch and then sprouts at the bottom. So take care of your crepe myrtles in your landscape, and they'll reward you with summer color, beautiful flowers, leaves that turn beautiful colors in the fall, and a really beautiful form in your winter landscape. Thanks, Bill. And if you'd like more information about pruning your ornamentals, write us here at Almanac Gardener. We'll also send you a free copy of Extension Successful Gardener, a monthly newsletter that tells you what you should be doing in your landscape this time of year. Write us at Almanac Gardener, Box 7603 in Raleigh. The zip's 27695-7603. You can send us an email message. And also, there's a website at NC State that's an excellent resource for all you gardeners in the Department of Horticultural Science. And when you write Almanac Gardener, we'll send you a free Almanac Gardener bookmark with the, some facts on it and also the web address. So send your questions in right away. Toby, here's one from Concord. Russ Elliott says, I have lots of clematis, and I've always had problems with the blossoms near the ground uh, being eaten by something. Can you suggest a spray, or should I just let it go? Uh, well, I'd probably trellis it up so they're not on the ground. That'd be the first thing probably to do. But uh, you may have problems with rabbits, and uh, I don't get a lot of calls and, uh, about that problem, so it may be an isolated thing that you probably ignore. But uh, there are some uh, repellents you can use for rabbits and other um, four-footed little beasts that are out in the garden. Uh, something like uh, repel, ropel uh, might work, or some peppers or wax sprays or several things for repellents. But it's probably an isolated situation. Yeah. It's one of those things that just happens in the landscape. Huh? Yeah, it does. You can't keep it all. That's right. It all can't be picture perfect. <laughs> From Raleigh, Karen, uh, Lorraine Nicholson writes, my yellow summer squash flowers and small vegetables form, then they die on the vine, before they can mature. What could be wrong with my summer squash? Well, it would be easier to show her if I had them here. Uh, we did a segment on this. But yellow squash has both male and female flowers. The female flower has a small fruit behind it from the very get-go. The male flower does not. It's just on a, a long petiole. And if you don't have pollination, you may get the, the maybe poor pollination, just not complete. You may get some development of that small fruit to start with. But if it's not been properly pollinated, more than likely the flower will fall off and it will start to shrivel from that end back. Um, what she needs to make sure she has is both male and female flowers and that she's getting pollination. If she doesn't think she's seeing a lot of bees, she may want to buy a, a small paintbrush and just kind of brush the pollen from the male flower into the female flower, mm -hmm. and that may help. So if she has plenty of plants, she should have a pretty good ratio? Right, right. Okay. But that's a, that's a very common question because they do have both male and female flower. Okay. Bill from Burlington, John Burke writes and says, on one of your shows, I saw Bill with a spray tank that has a filter. What kind of tank is that, and where can I get one? Well, I'm, I'm prejudiced about these sprayers, Mike. I, I really don't recommend that you buy uh, steel or galvanized sprayers. They rust. They have lots of problems. And these spray tips that you are going to adjust are, are just trouble. And if they're stopped up and you're down there playing with the thing and you've got some sort of chemical in there, you're getting it all over your hands. It's just a bad situation. So I like... Uh, Solo sprayers. It's it's a it's a brand name, but it's uh, and here's here's a small one here. But uh, they're in very common use, and uh, this thing is a, a plastic tank, which is not going to rust. And more importantly, it's got a, a commercial type tip. If we can uh, take a look at it here, and uh, inside this thing there is an inline filter, and it's a little uh, stainless steel screen, and it strains out everything before it gets to the tip. So you don't. It's not stopping up. Only if it stops up, this whole filter is clogged, and you can clean it out. 
that's pretty rare. Inside the tip, you actually have a spray tip which pops out, and this is a, a commercial spray tip. This was an 8004, it's a flat fan using for spraying herbicides, you can get hollow cones. It's just a very versatile sprayer. You can change the tips, you can uh, clean the filter, and uh, it just cuts down on all those headaches that you have with sprayers, and it's much safer, too, to have a good one. Mm -hmm. These things are less than $40, and they'll last forever. Mm -hmm. And uh, they won't, you know, you just can't go wrong. Don't let them freeze, that's your biggest problem. If they freeze in the winter, it'll, it'll, it'll break up. But uh, just drain it in the fall, and it's a good sprayer. And the name of that one, again, was? It's a Solo. It's solo just the brand name, but it's, uh, people will just call them a solo sprayer, kind of like a skill saw. Mm -hmm. Because they're so good, they've been just adopted, the name's been adopted by everyone who uses them. You just can't beat good equipment, can you? That's right, and it's not that expensive. Yeah. You know, uh, this time of year, we need to save water, we need to save fertilizer, and you can still have a lush lawn if you do some grass cycling. Let's join Karen as she explains what grass cycling's all about. Once that last fertilizer application has been made to your fescue lawn and the spring rains start to arrive, then what you end up with is your grass growing by leaps and bounds. Well, it's time to mow. Do you bag clippings? If you do, you're probably throwing away a valuable resource that can be left right where it came from. It's called grass cycling, and it's a process or program where you leave the grass clippings right on the lawn. By leaving grass clippings on the lawn, you actually account for 25% of the fertilizer needs of the grass plant for that year. That's a considerable amount. Now, it doesn't happen overnight. It's something that's going to build up. The other thing it does, and probably the most important in our house, is it cuts down on the time that it takes to mow. On the average quarter-acre lot, it takes you about 30 extra minutes to stop and unbag and put in a clear plastic bag to put out on the curb. So, by leaving the grass clippings, you get some added benefits here. And there's some others. When you leave the grass clippings, just like you're putting mulch around your trees and shrubs, it actually falls down between your grass plants. And when it does, it keeps the sun's rays from penetrating that soil surface. It keeps soil moisture in so that you don't have evaporation. And grass clippings are 75 to 80 percent water, so it adds that water right back down into the soil as well. You may even have the added benefit of that, those clippings acting like a mulch around the grass plants and helping to keep the sun's rays from penetrating that soil surface where weed seeds may be lying in wait. So you may even get some added relief from that. It was once thought, however, that by leaving grass clippings, you would build up thatch in the lawn. And this simply isn't true. Research has shown that, that thatch builds up in a cool season grass like this when you over fertilize, you have rapid growth, you can't keep up with the mowings, you um, are watering improperly, and the last thing is when you have disease problems that attack. Now, there is a brochure on grass cycling, and what this does is tells you the procedures and processes that you need to follow. There's really only three, and they're the key things that we work with with home lawns anyway. Watering, fertilizing, and of course mowing. In the case of watering, you want to water early in the morning so that you don't have uh, evaporation loss. Watering one inch of water per week is sufficient, and you may find that you don't even need that much. Watering uh, so that you're watering it deeply, say this week, wait until the grass starts to turn a, a greenish blue the next week before you'd water again. So it's an irregular type of watering approach for this. The other is fertilizing. We fertilize fescue or cool season grasses three times a year. We fertilize in September, the end of November, 1st of December, and then the end of February, 1st of March. And the last thing is mowing. And in the case of mowing, a lot of mowers now that you would purchase are mulching mowers. Or you might have an older mower that you can buy a mulching blade for. What you're going to do is mow so that you're mowing no more than about a third of the blade each week. By never removing a third of the blade, you never put the plant under any stress. And no matter what mower you have, you can leave the clippings. You don't want to leave a trail behind you is the key. Now the key with mulching mowers is that it keeps rotating or moving them through the mower uh, blade until they're so small that they actually fall down in between the plants themselves. So again, using the mulching mowers does help to shred those, those uh, blades up even finer. Sharp mower blades is also a key. You know, if you've gone on vacation, we've had rain, you haven't been able to mow, bagging is okay. But 
Instead of putting it on the curb, why not learn how to compost? There are brochures available as a cooperative extension service that will help you in learning to compost. And gardeners refer this to uh, black gold. They add it to their gardens. They put it around their trees and shrubs. It's, again, a great way of recycling an organic material. Watch as I mow. You'll see you don't see this trail of clippings behind. And easy and faster way to take care of your problems. Thanks, Karen. And for more information about grass cycling, write us here at Almanac Gardener. We'll have the address for you in just a few minutes. Toby, here's a question from Mildred Shirk in Raleigh. She says, I'd like to have a fruit tree as an espalier on a shed at my new home. What would you recommend? I was thinking perhaps of a peach tree. Is that a good idea? Peach? Well, peaches grow very fast, but I don't recommend peaches because of the pest problems. They're just too many problems for trying to have fruit and they're not consistent. Uh, look at an apple, uh, preferably one that's on a, a dwarfing rootstock, and I think you'll have much better success if you want to, to grow fruit. Uh, talking about fruit, if you're going to grow fruit, you're going to have to be committed to pest management. And there are many pests, uh, many of them soft-bodied that are fairly easy to control organically. And I brought in, Mike, a couple things here. Uh, you can actually use uh, the beneficial insects, and this is a little packet of uh, Trachogama a wasp, a little beneficial wasp that mm -hmm. I ordered this week. And they're hatching, and it looks like dust almost. That's These are tiny right little there. microscopic wasps that will parasitize the eggs and sometimes aphids and they reproduce and they're actually coming out of a parasitized eggs so that little block of cardboard is, is mailed to you with these little mummies of these insects or eggs mm. and uh, you release these several times during the season. Uh, greenhouse growers are using them for uh, fruit production, to tomato production particularly, uh, but gardeners can release those for pest control. So how do you get them out of there, Toby? Well, you actually they suggest, yeah, you could do that, a flute <laughs> or whatever, and they'll follow you home. But uh, we actually do re just release them out of the packet, preferably give them a little honey uh, for a day, and then release them, and they reproduce. Mm -hmm. uh, the next is a, a new uh, paola. It's a mixture of uh, a horticultural oil. This is canola oil, actually, with pyrethrin, uh, mm -hmm. an organic insecticide. And there, uh, all of those are great for soft-bodied insects like aphids or white flies or some caterpillars. So you can do it organically. You can buy the horticultural oils, but you will need to provide uh, some means for insect or pest control. Mm -hmm. You may have a big four-footed pest too, Mike, if you have fruit trees. I do on my apple trees. And I found out uh, zest soap or deodorant soaps may help to repel deer. Uh, certainly a 10-foot fence will help repair them, uh, repel them, but uh, zest will work. Uh, get your box, drill a hole through, through the box, and take a coat hanger and hang the uh, soap right up in um, in the, near the fruit oh, trees okay. or near the garden. So you don't have to catch them and wash them, you just hang no, it that, out there. that's right. Yeah, they have uh, good sanitation, good good hygiene, so they'll come right to the soap. Does that really work, you think? Does that well, soap? it's it's inexpensive, and they it, they say it will work. Bill, they have you, to replace it. But you tried that, Bill? On it doesn't hair. hurt, and uh, it's worth it. It's cheap, right, Toby? Inexpensive. Well, it's, it's kind of like the human hair. It's supposed to have that odor essence of humans, so they stay away from it. Mm -hmm. Thanks for bringing those in. Sure. Uh, Bill, here's a question from up Mashville. Terry uh, Sykes uh, writes this and says, uh, what's the best way to seed, save seeds from heirloom tomatoes? Well, you just uh, let, the, let the tomato get dead ripe, and then you uh, separate the seed from the pulp and uh, dry them out thoroughly and put them in a plastic bag like a Ziploc or a jar and put them in the freezer. Best place to do it. That's, That's, all, there to it. That's all there is to it. Would you, my grandfather used to save uh, watermelon seed. He always mm -hmm. used to get the biggest, richest sweetest looking tomato do you need? Well, that's a good point. You want to select the best plants you've got. Uh, mm -hmm. don't, don't get a little puny one. Get a good looking plant with a real nice tomato and save those seeds. Okay. Tom Gonzalez from Raleigh Karen says, my pink dogwood, it's about 10 years old, sprouted a white dogwood from its base when it bloomed. What should I do about this white sucker? Is there anything to worry about? Cut him off. If you want a pink tree, then you just need to cut that sucker off. They are um, grafted trees. So, um, typically, the, the white is the stronger, so it's used as the rootstock for the pink. And uh, just keep those pruned. Clip it off and don't worry about it. That's right. That's some great horticultural advice. Thank you for that. Toby, thanks for coming down. Karen, Bill, see you all next week. If you'd like our information on the program, write us here at Almanac Gardener. It's Box 7603 in Raleigh. 27695-7603. We'll send you information on grass cycling and also pruning, and we'll send you some web addresses. Uh, our t-shirt this week goes to John Burke, Mr. Burke over in uh, Burlington. 
congratulations, and we hope you enjoy that uh, T-shirt while you're out gardening. Next week, plants for water gardens. I hope you'll join us then. I'm Mike Gray. Have a good gardening week. So long. Almanac Gardener is made possible in part by a grant from Wyatt Quarrel Seed Company, distributor of Iron Knight, the all-natural fertilizer and soil supplement. Nothing greens like Iron Knight. This program was made possible by contributions to UNC TV from viewers like you. This is your statewide public television network, University of North Carolina Television.